Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Atlantic Council President and CEO Frederick Kemp. Saygıdeğer konuklarımız Atlantic Konseyi Başkanı ve CEO'su Sayın Frederick Kemp konuşmalarını yapacaklar. Uh, welcome back everybody and I want to salute uh, my team for really uh, upgrading the backdrops incredibly from last year. That's a, that's a wonderful, uh, Fatih, that's a dramatic beginning for whatever you're going to say next. Um, uh, the other thing, some of you didn't hear the first three or four seconds of Governor Perry's, Secretary Perry's uh, comments uh, on energy. And so I should repeat for you the one word that I don't think any of you heard, which was at the, front, uh, the beginning of the former Texas governor's address on energy, and that was howdy. So, so you missed howdy, so I'll say howdy to you. Howdy and good morning and welcome to our first session of the day a special briefing on the global and regional energy outlook. Um, this, uh, this, uh, the, this has become known as the Fatih Barol session. It's a little bit like going to Broadway and hearing Hamilton or uh, going to Madison Square Garden and the, um, and the Rolling Stones for the energy world to hear Fatih Barol's view on where, we're go where we are and where we're going is always, has always been the highlight and uh, most attended session of this uh, conference. It's an important issue to launch discussions of the summit to first take stock of the energy landscape and identify the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead uh, in global and regional energy cooperation. We're at a crucial moment uh, in global energy developments and geopolitical dynamics with implications for how we produce and consume energy and for the future of our rules-based international order. To state it bluntly, uh, the world is in flux. Energy and geopolitical landscapes are evolving in unexpected ways, often unexpected ways. Uh, the civil war in Syria, ongoing insurgency in Iraq, related security and migration challenges are shaping the geopolitical landscape, while technological developments, shifts in demand, and policy challenges are simultaneously transforming the energy landscape. A critical development since we last convened in Istanbul in 2014 uh, was the initiation of the Paris Agreement, uh, which has established the framework for international climate change cooperation. Under the agreement, the next few years are crucial in meeting our collective and individual commitments. Meanwhile, the costs of renewable technology have fallen dramatically, and new grid, technology, uh, grid technologies are changing uh, traditional electricity market structures. Additionally, the advent of hydraulic fracturing and the resurgence of American oil and gas production have upended international oil market di dynamics. In late 2015 and early 2016, oil markets reached historic lows, leading to the first coordinated OPEC uh, production cut since 2006. And of course, these price uh, levels have broad geopolitical implications. In concert with these shifts in production, non-OECD countries, namely China and India, are increasingly driving energy demand. In its 2016 World Energy Outlook, the IEA predicted that more than half of projected increases in energy demand until 2040 will come from non-OECD countries, and that's a major shift. While this shift has been underway since 2007, the impact is increasingly visible in energy markets. Uh, these changes are occurring in front of the backdrop of an increasingly interconnected world where energy trade flows across borders and across regions from energy producing to energy consuming countries. Amid these changes, Turkey's role in regional as well as global energy trade is growing more influential. 
a lot of the reason why we're here. Located between energy rich producing countries in Central Asia, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and energy consuming countries in Europe, Turkey plays a cr critical and crucial role as an energy crossroads and one of the world's most important hubs. With these dynamics in mind, I will turn the floor now over to Fatih Burol, Dr. Burol, esteemed director of the International Energy Agency. Uh, Fatih is no stranger to anyone in this room, having served as the IEA's director since 2015 and as chief economist and director of global energy economics before that. Uh, as, his, as the director of the IEA, he has pushed the agency to update its mandate to respond to the pressing climate and energy security challenges of the 21st century and has been at the forefront of outreach efforts to non-OECD countries. Just last month, the agency welcomed India, a real breakthrough, welcomed India, an emerging economy of crucial importance to global energy markets as an association member. Fatih is a na native of Germany and a fan of Galatasaray Football Club. Uh, so uh, Fatih, as you have home turf advantage, I'll let you take it away. And then after your presentation, I'll bring up the other, uh, I'll bring up the panelists and introduce them in turn. Fatih. Thank you very much, uh, Fred, for this um, <clears throat> nice and very generous introduction. And you uh, put the seats uh, for a discussion that I am going to have with many colleagues during the cafe break here. It is about, not about energy, but about uh, football. Because my team, unfortunately, lost last week to our arch rivals, Fenerbahce. And I'm sure many of the Fenerbahce fans are going to find me during the cafe break uh, here and uh, elevate what you just uh, said. Many thanks for that, Fred. Now, uh, I would like to update you a bit and give you new information in terms of what is happening in the oil markets, gas markets, renewables, and their implication on energy security and uh, environment. Looking, before looking at the future, let me start to tell you a few points of departures. Number one, United States. The, what is happening in the US shale oil and shale gas is transforming the US energy markets and also significant implications for the global oil and gas markets, as I'm going to tell you in a, a minute. At the same time, global energy transition is uh, gaining pace. For example, when we look at the carbon-free sources, last year, more than half of the global electricity demand growth has been met by the new renewable installations, especially wind and solar. It's a big thing. So wind and solar, their contribution last year of the, to meet the electricity demand growth was higher than coal, gas, nuclear, oil, everything put together in terms of electricity generation. And as uh, uh, Mr. Perry mentioned, US is definitely one of the countries where we see this strong growth, especially in Texas, where the, uh, the current secretary comes from. Not only renewables, but also in terms of nuclear installations, we have seen a strong growth, mainly driven by China. China is becoming the leader in the nuclear energy uh, worldwide in terms of it is installations at home, but also playing a role uh, internationally. 
Electric cars booming, the sales are booming with the declining prices, but more importantly, more and more governments are giving strong incentives in terms of subsidies, tax breaks, or some other regulatory measures. It is growing uh, very strongly, electric car sales. Having said that, it is still a small part of the total car sales. Universal access to energy remains a major problem. Today, about 20% of the world population, they have no access to electricity. In Africa, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other countries. Again, 2.7 billion people use primitive energy sources, such as wood, agricultural waste, animal waste for cooking, which has major implications for the health of those people in Asia and in Africa uh, mainly. Now, perhaps a statement now, which could uh, help to stimulate the debate in the next uh, uh, two days. We all know that the geopolitics have a had an implication on energy. But now what is happening is that the developments in the energy sector will have implications of the, on the key parameters of the geopolitics. So perhaps we can elaborate on that in the uh, next uh, sessions. And I think this is very important uh, to note, especially what is happening with the shale revolution this may well be one of the parameters, new parameters, additional parameters of the discussions on uh, geopolitics. Now, a few things on oil. As we have been discussing in the uh, recent Atlantic Council meetings and beyond, U.S. shale oil production is increasing, has been increasing in the last 10 years. In 2016, we saw a small, slight dip but again, our expectation is, again, strong enough for this year. Now, just put in a context, less than 10 years of time, shale oil production in the United States is equal to, for example, Iraq today. Only shale oil production in 10 years is equal to one of the major players in the uh, energy world, Iraq uh, production today more than significantly more than Iran, for example, if you want to put in a, a context. And this is definitely a major change in the global oil markets. Is shale oil production has its own characteristics, very different than the conventional oil. I will, I will give you two of them. I will not bother you with the details. The first one is, for a conversion oil project, when you have the investment decision today, if you are lucky, first oil flows in five, six years of time. So there is a lead time of five, six years. With the shale projects, you just open the tap to make it very uh, uh, extreme to make my point. So it's a very short lead time. So it can come and go very flexible. This is the first very important characteristic of the shale oil uh, production. This is number one. Number two is, again, a recent development. How much does it cost? Is it expensive or well, it is cheap? I think a major, again, achievement in the, of the technology in the United States today, the cost of producing shale oil declines sharply. It is now, most of the projects are profitable with the oil price just above $40. So putting these two things together, on one hand, we are seeing a very flexible, easily coming on stream 
oil deposits. On the other hand, they are less and less costly as a result of technological development. Having said that, two important reminders so that we are not carried away with these figures. Number one, the shale oil production is today 4.5 million barrels per day, and the global oil production is 85 million barrels per day. There is other part of the picture, and we see today a two-speed oil market. On one hand, U.S. shale is growing very strongly, oil. On the other hand, in terms of conventional oil, last year, we have the lowest number of new projects since 70 years on the conventional oil side. Two speed oil markets. This is number one we have to put in a context. Number two, despite this shale oil revolution and production growth, U.S., ladies and gentlemen, is still a significant today oil importer. Why I am saying this is that in terms of the exporting the oil, Middle East is and will remain very important for the global oil markets, especially in the context of oil importers in Asia. So these are the two important points I wanted to uh, highlight uh, to you to put the things in a context. Looking at the next five years, we see that the growth will come in terms of production mainly from U.S., followed by Brazil and uh, Canada. Brazil and Canadian projects are the projects which were already decided, sanctioned before the oil price fall. And with the U.S., we are seeing, with these prices, we are seeing the uh, increase uh, substantially. But our worry is, despite the growth in the U.S., production and elsewhere as a result of the declining activity in the conventional, the big part of the oil market, we may well see tightening of the oil markets in 2020s, which is a very important issue as far as the oil security and the oil prices are uh, concerned. Now let me move to gas markets. There are many friends uh, and colleagues here who follow the, our work at the IEA uh, uh, since some time. And some eight years ago, we said, in terms of shale gas, a silent revolution is starting in North America. At that time, shale gas was not very much discussed and not very much on the, on the table. And that silent revolution became very, very loud now in, with all its implications. And this revolution is now, we believe, followed by a second revolution, which is the LNG revolution. As you know, we have many diplomats here who know it very well by experience. Gas can be tra uh, transported two ways, pipelines and LNG. Just a few years ago, the share of pipelines in the gas markets was dominant. And today, LNG has a very significant share. Among others, thanks to the Qatar, we are very privileged to have the, uh, the Qatari minister uh, uh, with us. Qatar played a critical role. But now, in addition to Qatar, and this is the revolution, we are seeing substantial amount of LNG coming from Australia and the United States. In the United States, mainly as a result of shale gas revolution, and Australia, again, the uh, Colbert, methane, and others. And this gas, additional gas, will mean lots of LNG in the markets. And this will have, you will see, major implications. I will tell you two of them. Number one, it will have a, it will have a 
significant implication on the LNG contracts, from the prices to the formulation of the contracts. This includes the final destination class, which is an important uh, issue. This is number one. Number two implication is the this loss of LNG in the markets coming from Australia, US, and very soon Canada, Mozambique, Tanzania. This means that the hands of the gas importers will be stronger. There will be a lot of exporters looking for clients. And this is a historical chance for countries like Turkey to make the most out of it. And I know that Turkey made some steps here, including the, uh, the uh, new LNG terminals, including floating one. And in Europe, this is an important discussion. We have many European colleagues uh, here. Is the about 75% of the European existing contracts with the major pipeline exporters are coming to an end in the next five years. And this coincides very well with the LNG coming to the market. And this will make the hands of the European importers stronger. But to have a stronger hand doesn't mean necessarily that you use it in the best way. So we just provide the uh, data uh, here. But I can tell you that in the last seven years, 14 new countries in the world started to import LNG for the first time in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. And I'm sure we will uh, have the opportunity to hear about LNG from uh, the, uh, His Excellency Qatari uh, Minister. Now, renewables, as I said, when we say renewables, we have hydropower, solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, but here just focusing on the solar and uh, wind for a second. In 2010, this was the share of solar and wind in these countries. And in very few years of time, this increased substantially. Why it, why it uh, uh, increased so significantly? For two reasons. One, as uh, Fred mentioned, the cost of renewables went down substantially. Just to give an example, cost of solar in five years of time dropped by 80%. 80% and continues to uh, uh, go down. And the, I put here these countries, but the bulk of the growth in renewables come from the emerging countries. India and solar, two very important concepts you will hear more and more in, in the future. Wind and China. So these are the uh, countries. But while we have this. Uh, big drop of the cost, we at the same time see government support continuing in many uh, countries. Again, in Turkey, there is an important new project, the renewable resource uh, areas, and I hope that this will give a boost to large-scale renewable development, wind and solar, as uh, uh, Turkey has huge potential for uh, both of them, in addition to hydro and others. So these are all good news about renewables, but again, put it in a context, Kevin, it is the uh, ver uh, job uh, uh, we have, just put the things in a context. What are the challenges for renewables? Two of them. The first one is, if the share of intermittent renewables, which means solar and wind, what does intermittent mean? When you have sun, you have electricity. When you, have don't, you don't have sun, you don't have electricity. The same applies for wind. For example, in India, we imagine India, the, when you need the sun the most is 
the, the, when you take electricity most is when you go home late afternoon or in the evening to turn on your air conditioner when there is no sun. So how we integrate the solar and wind in the electricity systems without having major challenges coming from their intermittent nature. This is a major problem, especially with the growing share of solar and wind. Australia, there was a very serious problem in South Australia. We had an electricity cut, blackout in Australia, which is, if you go to Australia today, I don't know if you have colleagues from Australia, it, was the, it is currently the most important agenda item in the Australian political scene. And we have been tasked by the Australian government to make some recommendations to them, which I presented to Prime Minister Turnbull uh, last month. It is how we integrate them into the electricity system. China, same problem they are going to face. In some European countries, how we integrate the renewables? This is number one challenge. Number two challenge for renewables is the following. We have seen renewable penetration in the electricity generation, and it's a good part of the game, very successful, and it's going on, as you see from these numbers. But electricity generation is only a part of the energy picture, energy use. We use also energy for transportation, cars, trucks, jets, in the industry to run our motors, engines, and home for heating, cooling. And the role of renewables in these sectors is close to zero, very, very low. So therefore, the second challenge for renewables is, in addition to penetration electricity generation, to find new avenues to increase their share in the uh, energy mix in many countries, transportation, or in the industry, or in the uh, home heating and uh, cooling. Climate change and CO2 emissions. <clears throat> now here, we have some good news. We just published, I think, a few weeks ago, an important data, which is the following. As you know, carbon dioxide emissions are a very important pollutant, which has serious implications for our uh, environment. Now, what happened is that decades and decades, emissions increased when the global economy increased. Very clear. Years and years we have seen this trend. Only three times we saw the emissions did not increase. One, 1780, the recession. Second, collapse of the Soviet Union. And third, which was also uh, uh, important, 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, three times. Except for these three years, when the economy increased, we have seen CO2 emissions increased. So therefore, the question was, is it possible that we take care of our environment and the economy still grows? Our answer is absolutely yes. And this is based on evidence. 2014, 2015, and as we have uh, just uh, released, 2016, global CO2 emissions did not increase even though global economy performed more than 3%, increased more than 3%. So on one hand, you can have economic growth. On the other hand, if you have pragmatic right policies, you can keep the emissions under control. Therefore, one can easily see or expect a decoupling of the economic growth and emissions. And interestingly, <clears throat> the leader of the fight 
against climate change. Biggest reductions for the CO2 emissions came from the two top polluters, US being the champion of fighting against climate change, followed by China. Why US is the champion? Basically for two reasons. Number one, again coming back to the, where I started, the shale gas. Cheap shale gas replaced coal. Two, lots of wind and solar penetrated the market, mainly as a result of the tax credit system which was uh, established in the United States. So the biggest reduction in the emissions came from the United States and China, which is uh, definitely good news for uh, all of us. And we have seen different trends in different countries, for example, in Europe, unfortunately, we did not see a decline of the CO2 emissions for now. Now, if I have to finish my uh, remarks, uh, let me tell you that we, as the IEA, we believe that oil security is still very important. Looking at what is happening across the world, uh, Fred mentioned the developments, especially in this uh, region, in Iraq, Libya, uh, Syria, and other countries. But we think that electricity security and gas security is also very important to look after, which is a part of our broadening energy security mandate. Oil markets are changing. They are not moving at the same speed as I said. Two speed oil markets declining activity in the conventional oil across the world, 70 years low in terms of the new project starts and the discovery, what we, the oil we discovered, vis-a-vis -vis strong growth coming from the U.S. shale oil. But looking at the numbers, we may be, we may be putting too much burden on the shoulders of U.S. shale oil alone and we need to see other parts of the oil markets to be active uh, in order to avoid a major difficulty in the oil markets. Renewables, a success story across the world. The first chapter in the electricity generation was successful. Now, the second chapter is in the electricity sector, how do we integrate the intermittent solar and wind in the, our electricity systems in the most secure way? And uh, how do we, at the same time, find opportunities for renewables to penetrate the sectors be, uh, beyond the electricity sector, such as transportation, such as uh, industry and households? One issue I didn't mention in my uh, remarks, but I want to bring to attention, as I believe it's a critical one. Our lives, our social life, economic activities are becoming more and more digital. This digitalization of our lives, it is also affecting, slowly but surely, how we use, consume energy, and how we produce energy. And we have now started a major project at the IEA, and we are coming out in October this year, the impact of digitalization for the energy sector. This is a critical issue for the infrastructure, for example. I don't know if Melanie Kander is here. She made an excellent work uh, uh, last uh, uh, year on the critical infrastructure. This will have major implications for uh, the uh, electricity markets, energy markets, home heating to renewable uh, energy production. It will change a lot of things we knew up to now. And we are, uh, once again, to be on the modus side, once again, IEA will be the first one to come up with the, what are the implications of digitalization for the uh, energy sector, both on the demand and supply side. 
And finally, as I said in, uh, before, geopolitics, what is happening in the political arena, affected the energy sector a lot. We all know it. We have, we went through this, uh, the world went through this uh, since the uh, 70s up to now. But once again, this time, there is a, another twist to that. We may well see that the changes in the energy sector may have an implication on the discussion of geopolitics. This is, of course, uh, an important issue to be discussed, especially in the oil and uh, gas sector. Uh, this, uh, we are going to release a major report on the investment trends in the World P Petroleum Congress in Istanbul this year in July, major gathering, and we will highlight these issues as well. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Atlantic Council President and CEO Frederick Kemp, Atlantic Conseil Başkanı ve CEO'su Sayın Frederick Kemp'i yeniden sahneye davet ediyorum. Uh, uh... Thank you, Fatih. That's, uh, there, there's so much thought-provoking uh, material in that presentation. Um, you know, starting uh, from just statistics, electric car sales up 40%, uh, renewables covering half the growth of electricity. Um, the, uh, just looking at the revolution that you talked about in shale gas and then the second revolution of LNG, LNG and then the suggested third revolution, though I'll come back to this in, in renewables, uh, if one could, uh, could call it that yet. So there are lots and lots of uh, material to start with. Uh, so now let me uh, introduce the rest of our panelists before then turning to uh, Q&A. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Salah Abdul El Sada. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Qatar's Minister for Energy and, and, and Industry, a position you've had since 2011. You're also the Chairman of the Board and Managing Director of Qatar Petroleum, uh, which recently announced plans to lift the motor, moratorium on development of its north field. We'll come back and talk about that. And you also presided uh, as the OPEC Conference President in 2016, overseeing the development of the Algiers Accord and pursuant production cuts. So we'll have come back to both of those things. Uh, next, let me introduce uh, Halima Croft. Always terrific to have you uh, here and, and, and uh, managing head and global director of Com commodity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. You specialize in energy and geopolitics and lead a t team of commodity strategies uh, that covers energy metals and uh, cross-commodity investor activity, so we'll come back to that. Breaking Energy named, uh, Hel uh, Hel is it Halima or Hel Halima? Halima, as one of the top 10 women in energy in uh, 2013. It's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Majid Jafar, CEO of Crescent Petroleum, uh, the Middle East's oldest private oil and gas company. Uh, like Fatih, Majid serves on the International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council. In addition, uh, he is the Vice Chairman of the Crescent Group and Managing Director of Board of Donegas, Founder and Chairman of the Center for Economic Growth, a partnership with INSEAD uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, involved in all sorts of very interesting philanthropic work, including on the board of Queen Rainier Foundation, the Arab Forum for Environment and Development, uh, the Iraq Energy Institute, as, uh, and, and, and others. And then uh, last and certainly not least, uh, Ken Koyuma, Managing Director and Chief Economist of the Strategy Unit at the Institute for Energy Economics in Japan. Uh, Ken's held various positions at the Institute since 86, 1986 and lectures at the University of Tokyo's Graduate School of Public Policy. So I'm going to start with a round or two of questions uh, for this group and then turn to the audience as quickly as we can. Uh, also, I would ask the, the speakers if they want to intervene and, and, and make this more of an open discussion, if you hear something someone else has said, please feel free to make this as, as informal as we can. So Fatih, let me follow up. There's so much to follow up on your, um, 
your presentation, but let me grab a couple of pieces of it. Uh, one of them is uh, you've come back a couple of times to the potential geopolitical changes, and then you didn't say what they were. And so I wonder if you could drill down on where you think one, one should look most. Uh, my own instinct uh, would be that, that Russia is going to be uh, 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 considerably influenced in this, uh, but I'm sure it goes way beyond that. And then the second is um, you talked in your World Energy Outlook 2016 about a truly go global gas market. What does that actually mean? And thank you, Fred. And uh, let me start from the second one and come to the first. What does it mean we go, we move towards the uh, global uh, gas market? Oil market is one single uh, market today. The prices are more or less the same across the world. But in gas, we have the segmented markets in Asia Pacific, in the European basin, in Americas. We are thinking that with the increasing trade, especially LNG, these markets will be more and more interlinked with each other. Therefore, we may uh, see that the price differentials in three different markets may be less and less pronounced and it can be a much more of a flowing, flexible market. This is what we mean. Coming back to your, uh, the first question, I think uh, the geopolitics is not my uh, official uh, job uh, to, uh, how I say, to discuss about. Uh, you and uh, Mr. Hadley and there are many uh, very distinguished people here to talk about it. But what I see is that looking at the numbers, the oil and gas numbers of the United States, if I was the U.S. Secretary of State, I would sit in my chair much more comfortable in the international negotiations now compared to in the past. Second, if I was an exporter of oil and gas, and if it gave me a major stronghold in my position, but if I see that more and more competitors coming in the picture, I would be more uh, aware of the global developments and position myself differently now compared to in the past. What the major uh, for example, pipeline exporters have been enjoying many, many years in terms of the, their negotiating power, in terms of prices, in terms of the uh, trends, is now, in my view, put in the question significantly compared to uh, past. Third, in terms of the important countries, they have now very important new addresses to go if they want to import uh, oil and gas compared to past. This is there was in the past. As I said, for example, you are in one, you live in a street. There is, or in, in Washington, you don't have, uh, you have big uh, compounds. You have a, only one shop. You have to go there. It is the shortest to buy your milk, your bread, or whatever. Now, suddenly, from one day to another, in your district, wherever you live, there are three, four, five new shops open. <laughs> they will compete with each other. And now you have the, uh, you have the as a buyer, you have a, a very important advantage compared to past. It's a geopolitical advantage. It makes your hands free in terms of energy and energy-related foreign policy, which many of you know much better than uh, me. And therefore, I believe this shale revolution, oil, gas in US, Australia, Canada, Qatar is continuing to export. Uh, these uh, countries are giving a new uh, shape to the, uh, these discussions. Fascinating. And I'm sure in the questions I'll ask others, any of you who want to reflect on what you saw in, in Fatih's presentation, please do. Uh, Minister al um I do want to come back to this question of the OPEC conference and the Algiers Agreement, which I think is the first collective agreement to cut production since 2008. So, so a big deal. 
I, I, I do look back at Mark Twain when a, a newspaper had run an obituary on him and he wasn't yet dead and he came up with some sort of comment about how rumors of his death were greatly exaggerated. So I wonder whether rumors of OPEC's death have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, but, um, and, and what is the role of OPEC in this world that Fatih is talking about? Um, uh, and how would you rate progress in meeting the 32.5 million barrel per day production quota? Uh, so talk about whether you've reached the progress and whether there have been any unforeseen consequences of this effort. Thank you, Fred, and very good morning to you all. Well, as you know, um, the oil industry went through a bumpy road over the last three years or so. The industry is a very old industry, and uh, it's almost one and a half century ago since it started in the uh, in this modern form. It went through all types of challenges, the ups and downs, wars, uh, collapse of, of, of the demand, surplus of uh, uh, production. So that led to uh, the, the, a very high degree of maturity within the industry, be it OPEC or, or, or other organizations, that they deal with the uh, oil issues in a holistic view, very responsible view. Give you an example. That it is not the, the deliberation among OPEC uh, over the past few years wasn't a purely price but stability and balancing of the market which is not that much different from the priority of other organizations there have been a good degree of conversion in the industry and organization looking after uh, industry we noticed that with the uh, surplus of one and a half to two million barrel a day. That is uh, almost less than one and a half percent of uh, surplus between supply and demand, but created a glut. That a glut depressed oil price, but the consequence was that unprecedented shrinkage in investment. That will definitely, if the trend continues, that will definitely lead to another type of instability, a price spike, tightening the market, which is not in the favor of anybody. We learned that a long, long-term uh, upturn of oil price, high oil price, will lead uh, to a uh, crash in investment as a result of crash in uh, price. And that was what, what happened. Uh, almost a full decade of uh, high price led to overinvestment. Uh, eventually, we were uh, having surplus of uh, oil, but the, the consequences was so profi profound in our industry. Balancing bound to happen. That's the market. We believe firmly in the market uh, mechanisms. But what we wanted to do, and it is to obviously the interest of, of all producers and consumers alike, is to hasten that process of balancing. That we just go along with the natural process of market rebalancing. And this is what uh, we worked hard on in, in OPEC, but also with some participating non-OPEC countries. They were all convinced that uh, the market needs to be balanced. So we started to look at what 
is the criteria of balancing the market. We developed the, the we agreed on a criteria. Then we started to think about best ways and means to bring stability, a longer term stability, avoiding uh, market shocks. We uh, started, as you rightly said, with that historic agreement in Algiers, followed by uh, OPEC agreement, but we extended it to uh, uh, a number of few non-OPEC uh, countries. And to date, uh, I think it is uh, uh, a unique agreement. To date, the degree of adherence is uh, unheard of. Uh, it is uh, uh, almost 98% between OPEC and non-OPEC. When it comes to OPEC, the first quarter scored 104% adherence. Historically, we were, we were, we were struggling to, to reach 60 or 70% compliance. So uh, the, 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 the agreement was very successful and it helped um, the process of rebalancing. It wasn't uh, regarded to be, um, if you like, um, an accelerated uh, process because while we were dealing with the first part of the equation, that is the supply, but the, the, the demand has a different pattern altogether. So we started our exercise from 1st of January and as everybody knows, the first and second quarter every year um, has a lower demand to the extent that um, refinery utilization goes down to 85, 86%. It's picking up though, um, and we do expect towards uh, the end of next month, driving season will start third and fourth quarter uh, are usually of uh, higher demand. So that pattern um, uh, we, is, is different in the second half of the year. And we needed to, if you like, to see the full extent of the exercise uh, during the low demand season and the higher uh, season. And hopefully that we get uh, uh, a more accelerated balancing process in the second half of uh, this year. It's a very um, quick follow-up on that. Uh, I, I'm sure some people in the audience will wonder how you get more than 100% of compliance, but, uh, but aside from that, why do you think there's been this level of compliance? While in OPEC agreements in the past, that certainly hasn't been the case. What, what is the geopolitical situation or economic situation that has provided that this time? Well, the first uh, incentive for everybody to uh, get the market back to, to rebalance is basically the need for a stable uh, oil market. Stable oil market will mean a fair price and it will also help governments to better plan for their development. OPEC is, is mainly developing nations, and they have very ambitious developmental plans. The, the worst thing in the development plan, plan or plans are this instability in, in their economy. But to be honest with you, it's also we are in a world that the economy of the world is so inter, interlinked. Now, Fred, if you look at who is winning out of this low turn of oil price, in my view, it was uh, a negative sum game. We could not see champions, to be honest with you. It was a lose-lose situation. The uh, economic growth in the GDP was low, maximum to modest, but it was really uh, not that good whatsoever deflationary tendencies was there. Uh, debts, government debts increased hugely. So we couldn't see, to be honest with you, winner because the whole world is just interlinked. Uh, the oil producers and exporters 
are main, at the same time, they are main importers to goods from uh, consuming countries. So what happened with their lesser and lesser purchasing power, uh, consuming countries had uh, difficulty uh, selling the main products, if you like. And the whole cycle actually went back and uh, uh, the, the deflations took, took a place. In fact, for, for this long, we, we had the longest to probably um, interest rate stagnating uh, at a very low uh, level. Now, with the reasonably stable oil price since uh, the beginning of the year, we can see good signs of economic recovery. Not to the extent we wanted or the world wanted, but definitely uh, Europe and, let's say, Europe and, and the US is forecasted to be 2%. Um, India, above 7 uh, Latest IMF uh, prediction from 3.1 to 3.5 for, for this year and next year is 3.6 uh, and so on. China as well, better than expected. In fact, uh, latest PMI in Europe is staggering uh, 55 to 56. So the signs of recovery still started. Uh, who is driving the others? It is a uh, different schools of thought, but definitely oil price is linked to the uh, growth, economic growth of, of the world and vice versa, versa. So we need to be honest with you, a fair price balancing the markets, it is to the benefit of all. It looks like it's either a win-win situation or a lose-lose situation. So thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Halima, that almost sounds too good to be true. Um, uh, we're we're, we're uh, eagerly waiting for your voice on how we can best make money off of everything that, uh, that Fatih has just shown us. And I also wonder if you could comment on the minister's um, outlook uh, regarding the future oil price and efficacy and durability of the OPEC agreement and what, what, one, how one looks at this from an investor's standpoint. I mean, I think OPEC, when I think back to last year, I mean, I think 2016 was the year OPEC sort of got their relevance back. I mean, there was so much skepticism in the market about OPEC's ability to work together. And I think when oil prices crashed through 30 in January of 2016, you know, people were talking about, some analysts talking about, you know, crashing into the teens. And you had certain countries really facing a real political and economic and social implosion in that price environment. And I think the discussions about the freeze that started in January, led by countries like Qatar and Russia, were really the sort of kickstarter to that recovery in oil prices. So I think that really it was those initial freeze discussions later followed through with the OPEC agreement that people in the market started thinking, well, wait a second, maybe there is a floor put in in terms of prices. I would argue that OPEC, though, faced a hurricane of skepticism, even with the freeze discussions, because as we went into the Algiers Accord and then into that OPEC meeting, there was still a sense that OPEC wouldn't be able to overcome the differences between member states. I remember being on panels where people would say there's no way the Saudis and Iranians will ever be able to overcome their differences. There's no way countries like Nigeria and Venezuela won't cheat if there's an agreement. And so I think OPEC really had to sort of pull it together. And I think what they did in November, it wasn't just the size of the cut. It wasn't just that they were able to bring in non-OPEC producers. I think they understood what the market wanted to hear, that it wasn't enough just to come out with a collective number, so the collective aspiration. You had to have individual country quotas. I think that was so important. So many market participants were looking for those hard numbers. I don't think they were expected, so I thought OPEC really beat expectations. Same thing in terms of compliance. I mean, as soon as we got the agreement, the next question was, would there be cheating? And the levels of compliance have so far exceeded expectations. Again, I think it's just brought OPEC back in terms of relevancy. Now, on the other side of that, you have you know, persistently large you know, US inventories. You have a lot of market participants 
very focused on U.S. data releases. So even if you have inventory draws in places like Japan and other very important markets, we're very, very focused on the U.S. numbers and the return of U.S. production. So there still is this push-pull within the market. Our expectation, but the minister next to me has so much more information, will be that the agreement is extended, and I think that will be supportive for prices. So we do see us trending to a sort of low $60 price environment by year end. But in terms of the geopolitics, I would just warn that even with that type of recovery, there's still a number of very fragile, very unstable producers that were facing challenges when oil was above 100. And that recovery to the mid-50s, low 60s, still leaves countries like Venezuela, still leaves countries like Nigeria in very, very tough political and economic situation. And so I still expect quite a bit of instability in these producer countries. And that does have spillover effects to countries like the United States. Thank you, thank you for that. And I'll come back to you for another question in a second. Uh, Majid, um, you expressed concern in Davos uh, last year about the lack of upstream investment in the oil industry. Fatih had that also in one of his slides. What kind of investment declines are you seeing? Uh, and, and what are the risks within those for supply or price shocks? So I think, um, you know, Fatah put it very well, not only several years in a row of basically no new exploration in many basins around the world, but the lowest overall levels in terms of investment trends in uh, several generations, in 70 years, I think you said. Uh, I, I, you know, we can lose um, perspective that overall primary energy demand, uh, according to the, the BP report, is still going to increase by 25 percent by the end of next decade. That means we need to add the equivalent of six and a half Saudi Arabias in terms of total energy uh, output. And that's significant. And even if the oil demand may only grow one to two uh, million barrels in terms of total demand level annually, we forget that the supply is declining. So we have to add a new million to two million barrels, but we may be losing four or five million barrels in, in decline uh, rates. And so there is this need for upstream investment. So it is concerning when there is uh, such a worldwide uh, decline. Now, it, it, I think that when we look at um, our region and you know, look in the Middle East, we obviously have the, the lowest cost, but there's still decline in investment because, uh, well, of course, OPEC uh, quotas, but also government budgets. I mean, it's, it's not that the industry needs $50, $60 a barrel in our region. The governments need that or higher because of their de dependence on uh, oil revenues spending. So they're cutting back on upstream budgets as well. Uh, and there is a concern about instability and, and, and price shocks. Uh, and we actually had a, we've had quite a, over the last year or so, quite a stable period. But, but what Fatah Bey talked about, potentially by the end of the decade, having volatility and, and, and price rises is a concern. Um, for our region, from a private sector perspective, which is where we come from. I think what's happened in terms of US shale oil and the revolution is extremely positive. I mean, you know, governments in my region are concerned about price effects uh, and their budget requirements on a short term basis. But for the medium to long term, the impact on the industry overall worldwide has been hugely positive. Um, nobody's talking anymore about you know, peak oil, uh, pe people are recognizing that this industry uh, is continuously evolving and innovating. Uh, it's a high-tech industry, really, and uh, its role going forward is going to be very important. I mean, still 86% of, of uh, the primary energy supply is coming from fossil fuels. Uh, despite all the, the investments uh, that are made in, you know, in, in, looking solar, wind, and so on, it's still a couple of percent. Uh, so it is growing, but from a very small base. Uh, and we can't neglect the importance of uh, oil and gas 
uh, our region in the Middle East punches below our weight. We have half the world's reserves, and that's probably underreported because we haven't done that enough on exploration. And yet we have a third of the oil supply and a sixth of the gas supply. Uh, and every country in our region is actually gas short with the uh, exception of Qatar. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done. We've had perhaps an over-reliance on the state having to make all the investments. I think there could be a bigger role for the private sector and the state to play more of a role as regulator and revenue maximizer instead of feeling it needs to put up all the investment in the upstream when it has such huge budget requirements for health and education and social welfare uh, and so on. But we do need to take a look at how we encourage that uh, the regulatory uh, regimes and uh, the upstream uh, frameworks, but I think the region is going to be important for a long time to come. And in terms of this geopolitical question and the energy independence, energy independence is a myth. It's like economic independence. Unless you're a hermit living in a mud hut, not dealing with anyone, you're not independent. And in fact, I would argue that the U.S. now producing, you know, so to have such a rise in oil production, being such a big producer, makes it more dependent. <laughs> uh, and we saw when oil prices collapsed uh, last year, or the, uh, the end of the year before, the job losses that happened uh, in certain states in, in the United States and the impact on the, on the stock markets. The stock markets did not like that, that precipitous fall uh, in oil prices. And you know, if, even if North America and we still heard the U.S. is still an oil importer, even if North America may be self-sufficient in terms of the supply-demand balance, it still depends on what goes on. You know, the price is still set in, by, in the Middle East in many ways. Uh, you know, if something happened, you know, God forbid, in the Straits of Hormuz, you'd see very quickly how dependent the, the U.S. economy was uh, on the rest of the world. So it's good in a sense that the, the, the U.S., Politicians may feel less dependent on, on the Middle East or what go, uh, go, goes on, and that, that could actually make for more balanced uh, discussions. But I think we're all interdependent, and I think that's actually a good thing in terms of stability. Thank, thank you, Majid. Uh, just a um, uh, very brief follow-up, and, and maybe you can, I know th this could be a very long answer, but I wonder if you could uh, briefly take a look at what you think is going to um, happen with inter-regional trade in gas, which I know you're involved with. So KRG in Turkey, Qatar and Saudi, Saudi and Iran. Um, uh, where do you see the gas demand shaping the Middle East going forward, but even more, how do you see this inter-regional trade unfolding? So, so I used to say gas is the fuel of the 21st century. I now qualify that. I say gas should be the fuel of the 21st century because yeah. we do see some, some, some strange things going on in, in policy-wise in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, I mean, we talked about renewables. There, there's been $2.3 trillion invested in wind and solar in the last decade worldwide, and it provides today a total of 7 million barrels equivalent uh, per day. If you look at the market cap of the largest eight IOCs, you could buy them all for 1.5 trillion and have three times more <laughs> energy production as a result. So it's not very efficient. Solar in many countries is 10% of the time. Onshore wind, 20% of the time. So it, it's not that it, it's not important, but you often need the gas to back it up. So actually the two go hand in hand. They're not alternatives. And you see UAE has just projected its 2050 energy strategy. It's going to be about 40% each renewables and natural gas. Um, so natural gas has a key role uh, to play, including on the climate change uh, issue. The reason that the U.S. has the lowest emissions in a generation and the U.K. now like heading to the lowest emissions since the 19th century uh, is because of natural gas displacing coal. So putting them in the same bucket of fossil fuels is actually unhelpful. Uh, policy-wise. In terms of cross-border trade, we should be having so much more going on uh, in the region and outside the region, and I'm talking about the Middle East, uh, than we have. And of course the issue is uh, politics. You, know, you, you look at the U.S., one complete gas market with efficient pipeline infrastructure, traded, uh, you know, known pricing. You can't easily replicate that, but we need to try and uh, 
uh, learn from that. I mean, you know, our in uh, the Kurdistan region in, in north of Iraq, uh, we've we've proven up reserves in the two fields, two uh, P reserves of about 15 trillion cubic feet, uh, gas in place of 75 trillion cubic feet of of resources. That's potentially 10 to 15 percent of the gas in Qatar, which doesn't sound like a lot unless you know the gas reserves of Qatar, mashallah. So it's, it's really significant, and it's right on the Turkish, uh, you know, border. So by far the most cost-effective proximity to markets. We've got a consortium of five companies, two uh, Middle East companies, three European companies, total assets $200 billion plus, so significant consortium, uh, and yet uh, we can more than meet the local needs plus have potential uh, for export to Turkey and beyond. But what's been delaying it is, is really uh, politics and, uh, and policy. As for, uh, you know, Qatar and Saudi and, and Kuwait, I'll, I'll probably leave that to His Excellency to answer. But looking from a private sector perspective, it's interesting that with all these resources in the region, we have countries which are in, in the uh, GCC, importing LNG from as far as the United States now. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I mean, when I was in, in the late 90s in Shell in the LNG business, uh, we had oil at $12 a barrel, gas at not $60 a barrel when you take the energy equivalents. And the U.S. was a sink for gas. Anywhere you could produce gas, you could send it to the United States. Uh, and we were trying to uh, monetize some Qatari volumes, help take them to the United States. Now, it's the complete opposite. You've got oil $60 a barrel, natural gas $12 a barrel, at least in the United States, and the U.S. potentially competing, uh, converting a lot of those import terminals into export terminals and considering others and be becoming a competitor. Competitor abroad with gas exports and a competitor domestically with gas-fired industry, uh, like petrochemicals. Thank, thank, thank you, Majid. Uh, so, Ken, let me, um, uh, maybe you can take us to a, a different region and a different source of energy. Uh, so, your institute in its energy outlook for 2017 predicted uh, for Japan the restart of nuclear plants in Japan, uh, and that they would continue to steady pay, place depending on progress and regulatory standards. What's the status of the Japanese nuclear restart? And I think in Fatih's slides, I was surprised to see that uh, nuclear energy was at its peak level in terms of production. Uh, and, but on, on nuclear, how is this going to impact Japanese demand for LNG? Great, thank you very much for your question. Uh, yes, uh, Japan is now the, the world's largest uh, LNG uh, importer. Uh, last year, we imported 83 million tons of LNG accounting for 31% of global LNG trade. And as Fatih pointed out, that I 100% agree with his view that LNG is going to develop and or increase its share in the global energy trade. So in that context, Japan continues and, to and, very and well. most of that is from the Middle East, of course, right? Uh, the uh, LNG. Not necessarily. Of course, that Qatar yeah. is a very yeah. important uh, LNG supplier to Japan, but we have Australia, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia. Mm there are lots of supplies. And uh, just as a case of other LNG consumer, uh, there are many energy economic uh, fundamentals which affect our LNG appetite. But of course, nuclear restart is a key element. Before the accident, we imported just 70 million tons. But after the accident, the import volume increased up to 90 million tons and now 83. So depending on the future of nuclear restart, our appetite for LNG truly be very much affected. At this moment, we have 42 commercially available nuclear reactors, but only we have only three reactors in operation. But uh, I personally think that for next month and the next uh, two months later, uh, we'll have another two reactors can be reoperated. That's at the Takahama number three and number four of Kansai. And uh, also we have four other candidates for nuclear restart uh, we, toward the end of this year. So at this moment, only three reactors, but potentially we have in total nine reactors to be operated within this year. So what does this mean? With the rule of thumb, if we can operate the nuclear reactor of one gigawatt, 
uh, capacity in annual basis. This plant can potentially reduce the LNG consumption by more than one million ton per year. So if we have six additional reactor with a size of one gigawatt, it will affect the LNG consumption by several million tons of year. Of course, there are lots of uncertainty, there are lots of unpredictability in terms of the domestic politics. But clearly that if we successfully start to reoperate several nuclear reactors towards the end of this year, uh, we will see that the substantial reduction of LNG demand in Japan. But beyond that, uh, there are so many difficulty, political or social difficulty with regard to the more nuclear restart. But I do believe that the gradually that the successful restart of several plants for this year can pave the way for the longer nuclear restart for, and continue to affect. But again, I think that the LNG in Asia as a whole, not only in Japan, the Chinese LNG demand, Korean demand, Taiwanese demand, ASEAN demand will continue to rise. Of course, LNG need to compete with renewable, coal, and nuclear in Asia. But I think that, as Fatih pointed out, that uh, I think that we will see that the growth of LNG demand in Asia and the kind of sustainable and steady manner. Uh, th thank you very much. I, I do want to get to the audience, but just if, uh, Halim, if you could quickly answer one question and then I'm going to see if we have a few minutes for uh, one or two from the audience. Uh, you're specializing in the intersection of energy and geopolitics. Fatih was talking about uh, the, the geopolitics and how it's changing or could change here. But what are the wild cards? Because I think one of the things I really picked up at the IMF World Bank meetings last week was this incredible contrast from uh, the geoeconomic um, optimism and geopolitical risk. And, and it just seemed people kept upgrading and upgrading growth forecasts, assuming that none of these risks is going to come to bear. And I'm just wondering how you're looking at this. Yeah, we've actually been on CNBC together yeah. discussing yeah. this issue. And I think that many market participants don't price in political risk till a country is basically off a cliff. Right. Or till, you know, they look through it until there's a crisis. And I, again, when I look at the oil markets, and, you know, we have this sort of slow recovery scenario, but there are lots of black swans that may not be black swans. I mean, what would happen if we talk about a Venezuela you know, they have about 10 billion in reserves. You know, half of that is gold, which is not easily monetizable. And they have debt obligations this year exceeding their reserves. I mean, what would a messy default look like in Venezuela when they already have such profound humanitarian issues they're struggling with? What happens if Iran and the elections on May 19th? What if Rouhani is not reelected and we get a different government in Iran that might not be as committed to the nuclear deal? What does that mean going forward in terms of Iran's ability to place their barrel? So I think there are actually a lot of geopolitical risk issues out there. I mean, ISIS remains an ongoing threat to oil infrastructure. If any of those things materialize, that would have a profound implication for oil price because I think market participants just have discounted risk. And I think that's where the North American energy revolution has changed everything. Before we had such large amounts of shale production, the market would move on any hint of instability or any hint of an Israeli move towards striking Iran. Any rumor could set that off. Now, we tend to discount wars. We tend to discount supply coming off and remaining off in places like Libya because there's a belief that we have such large shock absorbers in terms of US production inventories to be able to handle these political crises. But at a certain point, those shock absorbers will be eroded. And these political risks, I think, will become more important for the market. So you, your, your feeling is that people believe too much in the shock absorbers. I see Fatih wants to comment here as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, do, I yeah. do. I think that given the sort of complacency about looming instability or ongoing instability, I think that, you know, we need several geopolitical problems to have it affect price. But that doesn't mean we couldn't have that happen. We couldn't have a profound crisis in Venezuela materialize in the next six months with other issues in producing countries. Fatih and then Maji. I see everyone wants to comment on this, so let's, let's, let's do a round here. No, yeah. I wanted to, in fact, give a very uh, different perspective and a, a bit of a, a strategic consideration here. Now, we have seen a huge drop in the prices, and uh, this was mainly coming as a result of the shale oil 
bring a lot of oil in the markets and the prices went down. Huge price shock. And the many oil producers, uh, Mr. Minister described very well and uh, our colleague and the Jaffa also mentioned, reacted in a way, in their own way, the agreement and the quotas cutting the production. This is all fine and good. I will not comment on that. But I want to comment on something else. Given the fact that the shale oil will be with us for many years to come, we are entering a boom and bust cycle and volatility of the oil prices. This oil price shock that the countries, oil producing countries are trying to manage may not be the last one, may be well be more deeper and the serious one in the future. Therefore, for me, it's a strategic reminder to single product economies, especially those who are relying on the oil export revenues in terms of their economic growth, it's a time, very time, to diversify their economic base. Some of the countries are doing it, some of them are doing less, some of them are doing more, but I believe in Turkish we say there is a good thing in every bad thing. I think the good thing in this oil price shock is an important reminder for the oil producing countries, oil exporting countries, relying on the oil export revenues to diversify their economic base. Otherwise, their economies will be very vulnerable to the, uh, the, the volatility of the oil prices in the future. This is time. Now, I do see uh, the minister wants to come in, Majid, but I just want to take a quick look at, let me take a quick look at the audience. Let me pick up a couple, because we're toward the end, but uh, please, John. Um, and identify yourself and whom you'd like to ask a question. And I'm just going to see, let's pick up these two and then we'll go back to the panel. Um, John Roberts with the Atlantic Council. What do you think the prospects are that U.S. shale oil by the end of this year will actually increase faster than the supposed decline in OPEC and non-OPEC production as a result of last November's agreement. And to whom are you asking the question? Well, to Fatih, but actually to anybody in the panel because it's a okay. general question. Okay, I see one other, please. Mehmet Ogutcu, Chairman of Bosphorus Energy Club. My question is to His Excellency, the Qatari Minister. How worried are you in the face of so many new producers coming to the market? Qatar is now the largest LNG provider to the world markets, but you have U.S. shale gas coming in Australia. We have more than seven uh, new installations under construction, East Africa, Russia, uh, KRG, uh, Leviathan in Israel. Is, is it possible that uh, Qatar will be maintaining its position? First question. Second question is the gas pricing, which is critical to us. We don't care where it comes from, apart from the energy security concerns. What matters to us is the price, pipeline gas versus LNG gas prices. How do you see the future in this regard? Um, so if, I don't see anything, if I don't see any other questions, I think those are the two we'll take, and then we'll go back uh, to the panel here. What? Sorry, what am I missing? What? Did you see some? Yeah. Ah, good. Beşat Gündüz, Turkish Airlines. Uh, in the aviation uh, sector, the, the airlines are putting great importance on the alternative fuels. So, uh, what do you think about the future of the alternative fuels or biofuels? Yeah, I didn't pick up. I'm sorry. Biofuels. The question. What's the question? Biofuels. Biofuels. Bi biofuels. I actually, uh, I'll come back to uh, Ken on that because I have a question for you also on, on something related to that. Okay, let's do this final round. Mr. Mr. Minister, if you could answer the question posed to you. I do remember when the U.S. was building all these terminals to receive your LNG. Uh, so that's changed uh, immediately. And I know you wanted to respond earlier to the geopolitical question, I think. I think the question is that uh, a lot of gas are coming into the market and how do we see that? Um, 
well, the story of uh, developing the LNG market or the gas uh, and uh, the Northfield gas, which is the biggest single uh, gas field in the world, was very interesting. Now, we started earlier, and we enjoy, and we're still in enjoying the first time, the, the first mover advantage. Mind you that many of the development happening today and happened over the past few, few years, they had uh, difficulties uh, with regard to the economics of their projects. And they, you know, some of them have, uh, they had to uh, write down and write off some of their assets and some total uh, uh, of their assets in, in some occasions. That is not the story here in Qatar. We went ahead with the field development early in the 90s. At that time, uh, it took us, uh, if you like, a vision to go and develop the huge uh, field and the LNG. As you can see, we, Qatar is still the largest uh, producer and exporter of uh, LNG at 77 million ton. At that time, we didn't have, we, Qatar was not credit rated. There wasn't enough market, and the, in fact, we didn't have a partner. The first partner moved away, and uh, we had to look at uh, look, look for other partners. But we moved uh, ahead with that. We built before we had uh, the financing, before we had a partner. We we built the biggest LNG terminal in the world, which is still the case, and it will be uh, for, for long to be the the biggest in the world. Now, with all these challenges we met at the very beginning, no partner, no financing, no customer. In fact, we had to uh, help uh, uh, creating a market. We spent a lot of money investment just to um, build terminal, receiving and regasification terminals. As you know, we have a number of them. One, for example, in the U.S. Uh, with U.S. partners, we built a huge uh, receiving facilities uh, in Sabine Bay together with American companies, and we are main shareholder, but nobody expected the uh, uh, shale gas revolution. And we have been, um, for a number of years, we have been uh, pursuing permits to turn it to an export terminal. And I'm glad to report that yesterday we got the permit to export uh, from that terminal uh, to anywhere in the world, as they say, non-FTA countries. Uh, so that challenges up front uh, led us to be in a more comfortable situation that instead of writing off or writing down capital, we, we, we paid off uh, the, the capital decently and nicely, and we are in a competitive uh, situation. And we think that uh, together with the, uh, the, the LNG is doing well. Uh, as you know, associated with the, with the LNG, we have uh, the condensate and the LPG the, and the, the, the petrochemicals we developed depending on uh, the uh, methane and ethane available in the gas. So we think that uh, the market today is well supplied. You are absolutely right. And it will be for the coming f few years. But these projects are very long uh, term projects. and. Uh, uh, the, the upturn is, is uh, definitely uh, going to come, and uh, the market will balance, yes, not in the coming two or three years, maybe four or five years, but it's, uh, it's likely to, to come back, especially with uh, all f uh, credible forecasters uh, show that the, the gas has uh, more growth than any other sort of fossil fuels. And within the, it's around 1.6%. That's double the growth of uh, oil of 0.8%. Uh, uh, but within the gas itself, we see 
uh, the LNG growth is 4.6%. Uh, it is a very, very high growth. And uh, we've seen today from the excellent presentation by uh, Fatah Birol that, that uh, the LNG is, is uh, not likely, but definitely going to be uh, uh, taken uh, the larger part of the uh, pie chart we saw. Um, and it's going to continue at that, uh, that growth. Mr. Minister, thank you for that. The organizers have uh, signaled to me that we're already over time, but if somebody has a 30-second answer to any of the other questions, I'm, I'm taking 30-second responses. Who, who, who has a 30-second? Uh, please, Majid. No, so yeah. just quickly on the issue of the, the geopolitics and, and the supplies, I wanted to remind everybody we had the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s, which was the longest war, you know, international war of the 20th century, two million people killed, never stopped them cooperating at OPEC. So once supplies are established, um, politics doesn't get in the way or, unless there's US sanctions that can affect development of an industry or if a government loses control over the producing territory. I mean, Iraq now is in the middle of a war with ISIS, but it's not in the producing areas and their record production. What politics can do, though, is prevent the initiation of those energy flows, and that's the real shame, whether it's, you know, in the GCC or, uh, you know, around Turkey. Relations within the GCC or between Turkey and Israel and Russia can change, turn and flip on a dime, but energy investments require long-term, you know, 25-year perspectives and shouldn't be at the mercy of the politics. So from the private sector, we would argue the need to depoliticize those decisions. Agreed. So, Ken, can you either do biofuels or methane hydrates in 30 seconds or less? Because this is, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, in Japan, yeah, Japanese uh, offshore area, we have uh, abundant uh, unconventional uh, missing hydrate resource, but uh, from technical point of view and economic commercial point of view, it's really a challenge. The government is very keen to uh, make uh, development of this resource as a strategic option, and actually within this month, the government and the government entity will make a second test of production of missing hydrate resources, and uh, after that, I think that they will make a decision whether or not they can go on the next stage of commercialization of the project. Uh, the, this is the end of the 18-year project, and uh, if it, the test can be made in a successful manner, I think that the commercialization process for the next, say, three, four years program may start. And I think, of course, it's very, very challenging and uh, takes years to come, but I think it's quite important an element to be considered and as a kind of a Japanese energy strategy. Thank you. Halima, I see you leaning forward. Yes, I, just, I would love to pick up on a comment that you made about this is potentially an opportunity in terms of low price environment for these countries to diversify, and I would say absolutely. But that period of adjustment when you do not expect the party to end can be profoundly brutal and profoundly disruptive. And so I don't think it's necessarily, in the end, some of these countries may come out in a better place, but it can be a very brutal adjustment process. And there are certain countries that are going to be enormously challenged over the next six to 12 months. And you mentioned the Iran-Iraq war with their supplies remaining intact, but Venezuela lost half their exports in the early 2000s. Libya is still down a million barrels, so things could get worse over the near term. This is domestic. And final word, Fatih, perhaps, and also an answer to John Roberts' question. Um, it was a shale oil contribution. Right. I think uh, shale oil will grow uh, strongly uh, this year and the years uh, later. And perhaps uh, since uh, you started with geopolitics, uh, Fred, just to making a, put in a, again a spice in the debate that we talk about the U.S. shale, oil, and gas, when we look at the, uh, the first indications from, coming from Washington mm -hmm. in terms of the new hints about the new energy uh, policy, uh, we may well uh, need to revise our U.S. oil and gas production estimations uh, upwards in the next years to come. Interesting. Good way to end. So, uh, uh, before you join me in thanking these wonderful panelists and Fatih for his presentation, 
I want to announce, uh, I should have at the beginning, this was all on the record. I think you all knew that. Um, we do have a hashtag throughout, which is hashtag AC Summit. The next session is at 11.45. It's next door at Fuji One, and it's the PPP model as a driving force for infrastructure and growth. I know a lot of you in your businesses are involved in that. We have terrific panel over there. Uh, it's starting at 11.45. I know we're just breaking up right now. My guess is it will start four or five minutes late so you can all get over there. Thank you very much, and thank, thank the panelists. I'm uh, uh, pleased for this wonderful panel.